and and Derek and, and Craig for wanting to publish the book, and of course Ramsey, who is the man, <laughs> Mr. P. Impress. He's in England. I just want to say I do a lot of work around literacy in Richmond, California, and there were some Richmond kids who were going to come today, and I'm so sorry that they they didn't make it, but uh, they would have loved so much coming into the city and coming to this bookstore and coming to this event. But anyway, um, yeah, that is my new little grandson. Yeah. <laughs> This reading is dedicated to Julian Edward Martin, who traveled all the way from Portland to be here. The February sky was pink and glazed and clear. Streaks of thin gold clouds streamed and looped like ribbons in the wind. The bright colors made the morning look tropical, as if the air were hot, but it was cold, unusually cold. In fact, it was so cold that layers of frost covered everything, patches of grass, native shrubs, tree limbs, Ivy's sleeping bag, and Ivy's hair. Small fishing boats returning from a long night at sea skimmed across the pink and gold reflections of clouds. They passed silently toward their berths, their home, on the other side of San Francisco Bay. From inside her sleeping bag, Ivy studied the boats bumping over the waves. She wondered when she'd have a house again. Everything looks as if it belongs somewhere, she sighed aloud. Creatures and things alike had a place, but she and her father had almost nothing. They were homeless. Up the hill, something round and glistening caught Ivy's eye. In the light of the sun, it shone like a tiny prism. Then it blinked. Ivy blinked, too, and stared at the spot. When it blinked again, she saw it was a black, button-sized eye of a small animal lying very still, still, a bright orb surrounded by a soft patch of white. Around the white was a fat head of dark fur, and white spots were splattered over both body and floppy ears. There was a glossy, wet nose that looked dipped in black ink. Slobber surrounded its mouth and stout, snout. There was no doubt in Ivy's mind it was a dog. As Ivy started uphill, the expectant dog lay still except for the tail. She reached down to pet its furry, fluffy head when a voice barked loudly behind her, away from that animal right now. Ivy stiffened. The dog's tail stopped wagging. You hear me? Poppy shouted as he rolled from his sleeping bag and galloped to Ivy's side, yanking her back to the campsite. That dog could be sick, he cried. It could bite you to bits. Ivy knew Poppy only got angry when he was afraid. Her father used anger to cover up his fears. He isn't sick, she reasoned. You know nothing about this dog, Poppy snapped. Ivy's green eyes darkened. It was her turn to get angry. I was searching for you, Ivy scolded the little dog. It's entirely your fault. Poppy gave the dog a good rub. He was nursing you all along. I missed one of my little... Um, Tabs, it's all right. She takes a fall. She cuts her head. She kind of goes unconscious. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a little <laughs> synapse there that you need to know. The dog inched forward and nuzzled Ivy's ribs. He wants to be with us, she said half-heartedly. The lines in Poppy's forehead deepened in a frown, but he said nothing more. He had explained a situation which needed no explaining. The shelters didn't permit animals. Food was scarce. The prospects of finding a place to live in the near future were slim. I understand why we can't have a dog, but it doesn't mean I accept it, Ivy said. Sometimes all the understanding in the world doesn't help, Poppy added. After all, he had tried to find a job and couldn't. 
He had tried to raise his daughter decently, and now he was failing at that too. Although more and more families were homeless and jobs harder and harder to come by, it didn't make acceptance any easier. Bitterness flooded his heart. Things will get better, Poppy forced himself to say, and then we can get a dog and a parakeet and a horse. Poppy, uh, Ivy smiled weakly. Her father was better at making promises than keeping them, but it was the best he could do these days. Making promises for the future was the only fun they had. While the dog ran joyfully in circles, Ivy rested in Poppy's arms, and when the dog tired out, he collapsed on Ivy's chest. A distant roar of sirens shattered the serenity of the morning. Bad accident out there, Poppy commented as he reached into his pocket and jangled a few quarters. How does a trip to Zeno's donut sound? For Ivy, it sounded like a promise Poppy could keep. However, the sirens grew steadily louder and closer, closer and louder until they stopped at the edge of the park road near their campsite. Hello? Hello? A voice shouted through a megaphone. Ivy looked anxiously at Poppy, treading through the brush and thick grove of trees towards the rim of the gully where police and ambulance medics. Anybody heard? Another voice shouted. Hello? Hello? Somebody call 911? Outlines of figures move slowly but surely in their direction, continuing to call. Does anybody need an ambulance? Ivy clung to Poppy's neck in terror. She was afraid of police and social workers and any authority who might take her away from her father. Her biggest fear was being separated from him. She knew homeless kids were sometimes put into foster care if their parents were considered unfit or vagrants. Vagrant meant an idle wanderer or tramp. Poppy was an idle or a tramp, but that didn't console Ivy. His worn out clothes and his long, unkempt hair made him look like a vagrant. She knew vagrancy was a crime, especially with a child.